uh, for um, Ms. Player Peters, that would be helpful. So you've got that, you've got um, MMPS school capacity, uh, enrollment and capacity pro um, report as well um, as the uh, 2021 summary page of the capital budget request. So we had a really good discussion and thank you all again for hanging in there with me and I finally made it. I was really waiting for that text though. Oh, David, you disappointed me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you did, a, um, we had a, a great discussion. And so um, Chris is gonna lead us through this document and um, I've got some pointed statements I'd like to make and I'll take full responsibility for everything that comes out of my mouth. Take it away. Thank you, Dr. Gentry. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. The, uh, the first one that I'll just mention would be the one that is color coded, that's uh, uh, landscaped. Um, this is a much more condensed version of the real document, which is right here, uh, where we have a lot more columns that we uh, don't have displayed here just so that it's easier to read. Um, but what we've tried to do uh, each year when we uh, discuss the capital improvement budget request is to provide you with information about each of the facilities or uh, geographic areas, uh, concentrating mainly on the year one request, which is represented by column H. Uh, the year one request would be uh, what we are asking or uh, requesting to be funded in the next capital spending plan. As we discussed at the board retreat on Friday, um, we have not received any capital funding uh, from the 2019-20 capital improvement budget request that you approved about a year ago, last January. And so, um, a lot of these are carry forward projects that were not funded since uh, we haven't received any capital funding. Um, and so we, we mainly concentrate on year one even though we're happy to talk about any of the other years that are reflected here. Uh, you do have uh, a legend or a series of legends at the bottom of the page that, uh, that represent the different colors uh, that you can see. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Let me know if, uh, or let uh, the team know if you, uh, needs some further explanation as it relates to the different colors that you'll see. Um, what we typically do is look at uh, two different things as far as prioritizing our capital request. Uh, the first would be any schools that are overcrowded uh, where the building utilization is over 100%. Uh, we look at uh, potential ways to alleviate that overcrowding, whether it be through some potential rezoning or from potentially classroom additions or even building a new school. Uh, secondly, we look at the uh, facility condition index score. The lower the facility index, facility condition index score, uh, the higher the, on the priority list. Uh, that would be schools that either need to be renovated or in some cases replaced. And some of these um, older schools, older school buildings have been on the list long enough where they have transitioned from a renovation project to a replacement project because you get to a certain point where it doesn't make sense necessarily to renovate an old building if it's not going to cost a whole lot more to just replace it. So we've been using a 75% uh, number. If the renovation cost is approaching 75% of the replacement cost, we have just included it as a replacement. Uh, so again, and a number of these uh, projects have been on our year one request for a number of years. And so we, we await a capital spending plan uh, from the mayor who would recommend that capital spending plan to the Metro Council. Ultimately, the council would approve it. Uh, as indicated uh, by Dr. Gentry, the second document uh, would be the school enrollment and capacity. Uh, this shows five years worth of student enrollment it is um, categorized by cluster, and so it's in alphabetical order. So Antioch cluster is first, but you can see the elementary, middle, and high school uh, enrollment, as well as the program capacity at each school, which then results in the building utilization uh, as a percentage. And then the, the last column just represents on a one-pager what our uh, year one request would be. You can see it's a, obviously a, a large number. Uh, $401 million uh, as a request, realizing that last year's year one request was $296 million uh, and we have not received any capital funding uh, as of yet. 
And so with that, I will turn it over to David Prophet uh, and Casey uh, Mego, and unless someone has a specific question for me to walk you through these documents. I just wanna make a couple of statements and the, most of this you guys will remember. Um, and I was reminded today. So in 1819, we received $63 million. And I think that was the year that we got it and it was specific that we had some portion of it was earmarked for specific things. So the, the monies came to us from the council, but they were clear about which projects they wanted those funds to go for, okay? So we didn't get to choose uh, in there. Uh, I want you to, to draw your attention to that last page again, um, where it has the sections of maintenance, technology, and construction. Uh, it is likely that if we get another 63 million type of a, of, a, of, a, of a funding, that these are the projects that we'll go to first just to keep things functioning and moving and, and, and going forward, which gives us back into the situation where you're rolling over high dollar projects into a 2021 ask, a 21-22 ask, and that $401 million number just continues to grow. And so, you know, I think we, we have had um, some, I don't know, titillating conversation about specific projects. I don't know that we've had titillating conversation about the whole idea of how we approach capital spending and improvement in budgeting. And so I think the, the information that is presented here and the way it's presented really allows us to have more poignant discussions about what's best for our students and what's best for the district. So I'm gonna say, this is the first thing that I'll say today that I'll probably get an email about later. And so when we think about the, the project that's been in Amy's, in Amy's area, the hundred, I think it's got $120 million on it now, but they've been piecemealing us monies, right? 10 million here and we specifically want you to use this for design. And then every year that we don't do anything significant, that land that we're just playing around with, the value of that gets impacted because we're doing little things to make it specifically for a school. If we decide that we've gone too far down this and we're now, this project has grown, so I will point this out. We first started this, it was at 109 million, then it went to 114, now it's at 120. So the cost of actually doing this work continues to grow as well. So we'll just have to keep all of that in mind when we have conversations about these projects, because if we're not moving on them in a way that it, it remains cost efficient and fiscally responsible, we've got to start thinking differently about what we do. We really, really do. Um, and then a part of this is going to be an MNPS next discussion, especially when you look at the schools that are priority schools, which are highlighted in the kind of tan color, they're innovation schools and they're also at low capacity, right? So school in my district, Robert Lillard, is at 42%, and it's on the list for a renovation. So again, are we being fiscally responsible? And it's my school, right? So I want my kids to have, you know, best that we can provide for them, but are we being fiscally responsible if we're investing $18 million in a school that is 42% if we don't have a plan to go with it to get it at a higher utilization? So bigger picture, we have silo discussions, but I think we're at a point now where we've gotta do more big picture thinking about our capital dollars and the projects that we actually invest and move forward with. Thank you. Board members, Dr. Battle, how are you? Um, so I wanna to touch on a couple of things uh, as Chris mentioned, and we'll start with that back number on the back page of the handout that is stapled, um, where I've started some of my discussions before, that $401 million, as Chris indicated, um, is roughly $100 million more than what we would normally have or anticipate for that total number, and that is a direct result of being told to not anticipate any uh, capital dollars for fiscal year uh, 1920 and to not anticipate most likely any uh, capital funds for 2021, what this list represents until October of this year. So um, that is why that number has, has grown quite a bit. And it also represents in the particular case, since it was brought up, the, the Hillwood project is at 120 million, is the anticipation <coughs> of that project not getting it, if it were to get funded, in not being able to get a hold of the money until January of 21. So uh, that's why that number is where it is. It's anticipated that that particular project, and most of our construction projects are going to increase if they're not funded anywhere from four and a half to 6% per year. 
Um, we have escalated, uh, because Hillwood is such a large number, we've escalated it on a quarterly basis, and it's roughly 1.25% uh, per quarter uh, that we don't uh, lock in the price vis-a-vis -vis a, a, a bid process and that sort of thing and get it actually started. So that's where we are right now. The other projects, um, three prime examples of what Dr. Gentry expressed uh, relative to renovation and new, or what Chris expressed too, um, on the 75% rule, as we like to call it, um, is Goodlettsville Elementary School, Percy Priest, and Lakeview. Uh, all three of those uh, three years ago were renovation projects because escalated their estimates went above that 75% mark um, they've turned now into brand new replacement schools. As we go forward, um, I guess to address what uh, some Dr. Gentry's concerns, um, when we have these projects that go forward like this we and, and not funded, we're sitting there with projects that we're having to repair. Goodlettsville Elementary is a prime example. Um, we've had to go in in one particular wing and re- uh, uh, rework the entire HVAC system in one wing because the components in that wing failed. And we obviously can't let our kids not have a, a performing school. So, uh, but that's monies that we would not have had to have spent had it been properly funded. So that's, that's sort of where we are. Uh, some of the other projects we uh, have, we are in the process of buying uh, property now. Um, uh, for the new Cane Ridge Cluster Middle School in the Antioch area. And uh, so we are asking for the design fees for the new school on it this year so we can get that started. And then in year two, as it's indicated here, we'll ask for the actual construction dollars for that school. Uh, we have the three previously mentioned schools, Goodlettsville Elementary, Lakeview, and Percy Priest included. Uh, they're, again, carryover schools from previous uh, budget requests. And then we have um, the build out of the third floor of Goodlettsville Middle School as well that we need to just go ahead and, and get done. And that will take care of that school for years, to, several years to come uh, relative to capacity. Uh, beyond that, we do have Robert Lillard on there as Dr. Gentry talked about, which we hope will be discussed uh, a little bit more as we move ahead in, in some of our discussions yet to come. And then uh, about what we can do with the school. And then Westmead Elementary is on there. And as we talked to Ms. Frog um, and explained that project, uh, we've asked for the design fees only uh, as its actual construction then would be contingent upon uh, the Hillwood High School project being complete so we can use the current Hillwood High School as swing space for the students at Westmead. So uh, that's sort of where we are with the first year piece. Let me, uh, I want to follow up with uh, something that Dr. Gentry talked about on that last page. Uh, if we don't receive the, the amount of funding that we uh, have asked for relative to these capital construction projects on the front, uh, my recommendation uh, to Chris and Dr. Battle will in fact be uh, that we uh, use that money more for the deferred maintenance pieces. Uh, bus uh, replacement in our IT capital improvements um, in, uh, infrastructure. Um, it's listed on the back page of that document. Um, just so that you as a board will know if it's ever brought up, deferred maintenance in, in our um, district, we should be spending somewhere around 50 to $60 million a year. Uh, and that's based on current replacement value of our building and the Council of Great City Schools with a recommendation nationwide of about 2.2% of that current replacement value as to what you put forth to your deferred maintenance. Realistically, we can only spend about 35 to $40 million a year because as you know, most of our work uh, occurs during the summer months prior to school starting in August. The rest of the time the buildings are are uh, utilized, so it's kind of hard to get in there. So when you talk about the labor forces in the Davidson County area, in the metro area, uh, along with the amount of uh, construction going on, and quite frankly, the, uh, the ability of finding construction workers to work on our projects, it becomes very limited. So that reality, while we need to be spending 50 and $60 million a year on just the mechanical deferred maintenance, we can only spend probably adequately about 35 to 40. It's a little bit less. 
uh, over the last 14 years since 2007, we've only been spending, based on what's been funded to the district, about $8.8 .8 million per year for deferred maintenance. It's a very low amount, and it's hard to keep up with that amount. And so we're now getting into issues occurring throughout the district, such as the Goodlettsville Elementary School situation, where we've the Band-Aids are falling off and the adhesive no longer sticks. So that's sort of where we are with that. So uh, any, uh, if there's any questions about capacity, condition scores, or anything like that of our schools, I'd be glad to answer. Casey's well-versed in those type of things. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I just want to uh, add to what you said about Goodless Fall Elementary. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a Veterans <coughs> Day program in November, and while all the school, all the students were assembled in the auditorium, and we had a couple of hundred visitors, if not more, the fourth grade ceiling fell down. No child was hurt. It was raining outside, and no child was hurt because all the students were in assembly. But these things are vital for the safety of our students. So thank you for your work. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I don't have. Are you going to? Amy. Oh, Bert. sorry. I, I thought I thought I got a knowledge. Level. I don't have questions. I just I felt I felt the need to kind of address the Hillwood situation and also sort of just the overall funding problems that we've had. Um, so first of all, when I was first elected in 2012, we had a billion dollar backlog on capital projects and. Um, Dr. Register at the time said that we needed 200 million at least a year to start catching up, and so that that went on for a while. But we didn't always get the the 200 million, and, and it was part of, partially because there was no funding during the recession, and we're now we're running into the same problem again. Um, and I would be curious to know. I, I've been told that under a while back, maybe Purcell and Bredesen, that we got a large amount of funding at one time at the same. For example, like the when the Titan Stadium was funded which was um, that we got maybe four or 500 million, like what we're asking for this year. I'd be curious to know if there have been time periods when we have gotten a large amount, because to me it seems like that's the solution. If we could get full funding or close to full funding now or next year, and then that would help with the deferred maintenance. And then we could start, and once we kind of have one big, um, one, you know, one large funding amount, then we could then begin to catch up, slowly catch up all the other, that, that to me, that seems like the solution and that'd be something we could advocate for. Um, if you want to answer this fine, then I'll. I'll just give a, a little, it predates me actually from yeah. uh, my time here. Back, I think it was around 2000, then Mayor Bredesen, as part of the uh, desegregation case uh, where the district went into unitary status and uh, the, the desegregation case was dismissed, there was a, a large capital um, uh, allocation to the school district for a number, a large number of projects throughout the district. I don't have the exact number, but I know that it was probably more than we've received since I've, it is more than we've received since I've been here. Uh, we've never received 200 million capital funding since I've been here. The, I think uh, never approached that, but that one year, and it was over multiple years, uh, that may be what you're remembering, uh, because it, uh, but it was a part of the uh, dismissal of the desegregation case. So it, it, it goes back to maybe 99 or uh, 2000. But I know uh, David has a listing of, of what we've received, I think you've, since 2007, so he can go over those. Okay. We've had uh, capital funding anywhere from as little as, I don't have a cumulative total of, t of the capital, but uh, as little as uh, $60 million, which was in 2019, um, all the way up to 150, I'm getting old, sorry, 154 million uh, in 2017. Of course, that was when we were budgeting for Hillsboro and 48 million, I believe of that one year was for that and 40 million the next year. Um, so, I mean, I can get you this total, be glad to share this particular document with you. Um, the, um, it, I've created this particular document to, to look at deferred maintenance. And uh, of those amounts, you know, I mentioned that we should be spending $60 million roughly a year on deferred maintenance. 
Uh, for those total 14 years, we were only able to put in $124 million for deferred maintenance. That's an average of $8.8 .8 million a year. So we're very well underfunded when it comes to deferred maintenance. So we were in the meeting earlier, and someone made reference to a different source of money that other departments are able to use for their maintenance that MNPS does not have access to. Could you speak more about that? We, 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 our budget is divided into two pieces, one called the district-wide funds, which is that sheet on the last, last sheet of the staple document. And it is the, what we consider the equivalent of metro, other metro departments' 4% fund which is uh, based upon uh, revenue uh, that they have left um, that they are able to draw off of for various and sundry pieces and, you know, construction pieces or, you know, technology uh, infrastructure or, you know, those kind of things. We don't have that access. So this becomes our 4% fund, this district-wide piece. Is it because we're not revenue generating? Why, why don't we have access? To I, Chris could answer that better than I. I don't really know that, why it's divided out there, or why we're not able to do that other than possibly through the charter. I, I, I don't know myself. Hmm. Just thought I'd throw it out there. So, okay, on Hillwood, so I just want to kind of go, because a lot of people were on the board when we had that vote, and it was a very contentious vote, and I just want to kind of get the background. So when we decided to move Hillwood to a new property, um, we had about two years of meetings about this community meetings. They were all over the city and they, you know, we had them in, in the, on the west side of town, we had them in North Nashville because we draw a lot of the students from North Nashville. And um, the initial plan was to uh, sell the property that Hillwood is sitting on now um, and then use that money to buy a new property. And that ended up, we got a lot of community pushback. And so during all of our community meetings, we reassured the public that we were not gonna sell that property. Um, and I am, you know, if I don't have a problem selling a property if we just can't use it, and that's what happened with Brookmead last year in my district, we had a, a property that just, we tried for years, we looked at different ways to repurpose it, and there really was not a good use for it for the district, so we ended up selling that, and I was fine with that. The Hillwood property, um, First of all, and I can't remember what the what the appraisal was on it. I don't know if you remember, but it, it was it it would I mean I want I want to I wanted to hazard a guess because I'll be wrong, but it, it was not um, it wouldn't have off offset the the um, the the purchase price of the new or the new facility by much. And so so that's part A. But part B is there are a lot of um, different uses for that property that we've discussed. Um, we we're talking about. We need a, an ex expansion or a new middle school. We need um, Westmead Elementary, like I've been told, literally like there, people can poke a finger through a, a, a corner of the wall because uh, we just desperately need to rebuild Westmead Elementary. But everything in my district is hinging on this high school. So we can't really do any of the other projects till we get the high school done. And then so people know we have bought the property, the new property for the high school. It has been leveled out. We have a really great plan that I got to go in and, and see with the architects. And, um, but it's, I mean, we've invested quite a bit in the new property. So if we were to scrap this project, we're, it's, it's a big waste of funds that we've already put into it. Um, and also, like I said, the Hillwood, the current Hillwood property um, is, uh, it's valuable land. I think it'd be short-sighted to try to sell it at this point and also I think that we could find a lot of uh, uses for it for the district if not you know, we've talked about administrative offices being there um, you know an elementary uh, middle school we don't really know until we get this high school moved um, and then the current Hillwood property which I know is probably not much different for all of you all but like you know there's reports of roaches and you know, you know, rats, and I mean, it just needs. We really need a new facility. It's just, and it's, and we looked into trying to renovate it on the current property, and it just didn't make any sense because we would have spent a lot of money renovating it, and then it would have um, not served our needs very well. And so that's really the reasoning behind it. I know it's expensive. I hate that the cost keeps going up, um, but that's just a function largely of the fact that we're just not getting funded. So yeah, Exactly. And so right. it's not the, the suggestion yeah, yeah. is not that we even consider scrapping it. The point that we yeah. need to reiterate and keep pushing with right. our partners over here across the way right. is <laughs> that yeah. we are losing money and, yeah. and it's costing us more the more they defer 
fully right. funding it or funding us enough so that we can start to make some progress. Right. To that, so I think Frank, you have oh, your hand up. Yeah. Okay, so where are we on my, my school? Just break it down. Which you school? Got the, uh, for the middle school in Antioch. The Antioch Middle School? Uh, yeah. No, 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 just the middle school in my district. Where are we at as far as I know you purchased land. We the Cane Ridge Cluster Middle yes. School, yes, ma'am. Yes. Give me we some are, updates on that. We are in the process of purchasing the property. Okay. Uh, so the land has not been bought yet. We are in the process of it. It hasn't been paid for yet, but we have a contractual agreement to buy it. How much? Um, 2.9. Yeah, you're voting on it tonight. It's in the agenda. It's 2.9 million, I believe it is. Okay. That's what it is. And um, once the board approves it, it has been approved at Metro Finance for moving it to the council's vote. They have to approve it for us to purchase it. And Metro Properties will handle that purchase. And then once that is, um, you know, happens, it's it's ours. Now, in this, this particular budget that we're presenting now uh, that we will again address by, on the 28th when you actually vote for it, um, we'll be asking for the design fees on that building. It takes roughly nine months to a year to get through the design, the construction documents, the permitting, and the bidding process and that sort of thing on any project. Once that happens, next year we'll be asking for, while all of that's going on, Next year, we'll be asking for the construction dollars for the school. So the anticipation is, is that we'll hopefully get the money for that next year, and then we can, when it, when the drawings and all of the permits are finished, we can start the process of of, of building it. Um, it's about a three-year process total. Long time. That's where we're at. I'll be at like 150 percent on all my schools by that time basically, because I'm well over almost there within well, probably next year, all the building that's going on out there. So. We'll see the projected growth that is in that document that it was attached uh, uh, by cluster, so you can see what the yeah, anticipated I mean, yeah, growth I've, I've, is. I've looked at it, but three it's years high. down the line, yeah, we'll be really, really bad, yeah. And that's why it's so important <coughs> that we look way, be I mean, because we knew this was going to happen with the Antioch and Cambridge cluster. We knew it was gonna happen. And we're so slow, we're, we're moving the needle so slow, and then we wanna you know, fight about the charter schools that are taking over you know, or moving into our districts. It's such a fast pace because they're able to find you know, untraditional buildings um, to move and you know, start to recruit. Right. So that's why we, we're in this situation. That's why I keep saying it. That's why I keep telling my colleagues. And let me, know, address, so. let me address that thing about non-traditional buildings. Uh, because that's been presented to me before, too. We build buildings for 20, 30, 40, 50 years to last that long. Uh, those non-traditional buildings uh, are things like Kmart department stores. If you all ever see a tornado, what's the first thing they show you that's been ripped to shreds? A Kmart. A Kmart. <laughs> so I wouldn't ever recommend putting our our kids in a building like that. No, I'm not saying that. Well, no, I'm, I'm just saying, saying that we what, talk about non-traditional. Right. This is what we're seeing, how charters are able to move. Right. It's but because we, they do their own thing by doing their process. Right. But we can't do that. But, and, and I understand that. I'm saying what it's I'm saying is, is that, yeah, it is a very slow process. And that's the reason why, again, we get into this war about charter schools uh, moving in district because they are going to move pretty fast in my district because of how uh, slowly we move the needle on looking at looking at trajectory, looking at our numbers, looking at the outcomes of growth. And so then we're in this situation. So I have three years to wait for literally a middle school and hopefully everything works out. Well, on so. land too, uh, Ms. Bush, we've been looking for the land for this project literally um, for a year and a half or two years. And it is very hard to come by, particularly in this area. Um, and then we finally stepped out from Metro Properties, not that they haven't been partners, they have been, but we started doing some of our own digging and uh, went back to Metro Properties and said, we need you to look at this property or that piece or this piece and whatnot. And so that's how we came upon this piece of property is through some early digging ourselves. So we'll, we'll get through it. Where, where is the land located? It's at 5557 Mount View Road. If you're there at Freeman Chevrolet and you're heading out 
Mountain View Road. After you go through the red light there, it's uh, it's about 500 to 1,000 feet up on the left. Just past, um, I forget what this, the road is that cuts back to uh, Baby Ruth. Just after you pass Baby Ruth, it's about two properties just past that on the left, about 300, 400 feet. Go ahead. It's all right. Thank you. All right, so in regards to the, uh, we'll first start with the Antioch Middle. So the monies that we have to pay for that land, if we approve it tonight, does that come from our 2018 monies, the last monies that we received? That is correct. Okay. And then how much, now I would like to say on your behalf that uh, Mr. David Prophet has done a really, I think, a great job like trying to ring the bell and save money as much as we could in anticipation of this happening. So, so far, how much money... Since we're not expecting any funding for the 2019-2020 year and potentially the 2020-2021, mm -hmm. am I saying that right, um, year, sorry, that trips me up a little bit, how much money do we have left to spend? In capital dollars, um, we have about a million and a half dollars in maintenance, and we have about six to seven million dollars available if I need it in an emergency for other capital needs. So we have one million left available for maintenance. Plus or minus, yes, ma'am. And about six to seven for emergencies. What would be considered an emergency? The ceiling falling in a good let's miss. Oh, a boiler, a boiler, <laughs> a boiler. Well, yes. a boiler. Yeah, that would be um, a boiler replacement, for example. Okay. Uh, if the boiler systems and we have several uh, mechanical systems in this district that are 20, 30, 40 years old that are at that point of needing replacing. So um, they could go, Goodlessville Middle School is a prime example, or elementary school is a prime example. We, we had a boiler go out there. And um, so we had to put in a different type of HVAC system for that school. Uh, well, yeah, we did buy them so that we could take those systems back out and repurpose them in other schools for emergency needs and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, those are the type of things, just systems failures. I mean, that's what, that's what you're looking at. Uh, you may have, uh, even though this isn't a school, uh, we had to replace the switch gear downstairs in this building because it was old, outdated. We couldn't get parts for it. Every time a breaker would go off, we had to make a special order someplace for a, a special breaker to be built, and it was just time that it needed to be replaced. And it went down. And so we had to, we had to replace it, or it was getting ready to go down. So those are the kind of things that we look at, the systems. Um, yeah. I, get, I don't know if you have this number, and if you don't, of course, you're welcome to get back to me on that. Six to seven million dollars on emergency funds, though I appreciate it being saved from whatever you could save it from, mm -hmm. it, it seems extremely insignificant in the amount that we would need. So how much do we usually spend on those types of emergency projects? I can get you that a, a better number uh, than just taking it off the top of my head. I would say it would be somewhere around two to three million uh, max. Uh, we 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 have a maintenance department that, that with what they have and what they do do an awful good job of taking care of the so-called uh, band aids on our systems right now. They do a really good job. So I, I you know, <laughs> we unfortunately don't have. We don't have a lot of those dire emergencies okay, that you might be alluding to, but we do have them, and we're able to take care of them in a fashionable manner. Okay, and that needs to last us for the rest of this school year and potentially through next school year. Uh, is what we're being kind of. I can't to. give you an exact time, but we have been told not to anticipate any monies before the fall of this year. What did you do? Mr. Poppet, um, and welcome Mr. back. Pardon? And welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Henson. Um, quite often, states that we have our buildings are an average of um, 50 years old, um, and that we also are on a schedule of purchasing buses, and that we so that we don't have a surprise at the end of any particular year that we had to purchase like 18 school buses. So where are we in that particular process? So two questions. How old is this building, for one thing? And then, totally unrelated, where are we in the process of purchasing school buses? 
Would I'll it have to come out of these funds that you just stated? They will. Uh, I'll let Ken Stark talk to that. Um, our Executive Officer of Operations, who has the Transportation Department. Uh, relative to this building, it was built in three or four pieces. So oh, okay. I can get you those years. Uh, I think the front piece was, don't hold me to this, it was like 1930s or 40s. Wow. Uh, this piece was in the 70s. I think most of it was in the 70s and early 80s. So, but I can get you those exact numbers. And Kim, right. you want to? I'll jump in oh, okay. quick. Sorry. That's okay. Um, well, I guess the, the question relating to this building, of course, uh, part of this building was a school. Uh, back a long time ago. Uh, this particular area was added later, uh, probably around the same time as the tower that connects to the two buildings, which was in the 70s, which Joe Edgens actually was the architect on on that uh, addition. And then the front part, you can tell, is, is old. I don't have the exact years. I know there's a, uh, a cornerstone right out here. Where am I? Right out here for the school itself. Um, and I can't remember the year, but it's a it's a it's three different buildings, almost four cobbled together. As far as the the buses go, yes, we do fund bus replacements uh, from our capital budget. Uh, there's a state requirement to um, replace buses when they reach uh, 15 years of age, and so we do have a, a schedule that we plan so that we don't have a huge number in any one year or try not to. But again, it's all very capital dependent. Uh, Ken can provide a lot more information regarding the number that we would need to replace on average to stay current. Um, good evening. Um, we're uh, aiming our fleet when we try to right size our fleet to have about 600 buses in it. Um, if you divide 15 years by 600, it means we need to be buying about 40 a year. Um, a school bus um, costs on average about 100,000 each. Um, some are a little more, some are, are a little less, but on average 100,000 is a good, um, pretty round number. Um, we have not, uh, I think we hit the 40 number two years ago. Um, last year we were a little bit shy of that, and again this year we don't, we haven't gotten any money, so we're not, doesn't look like we're buying any this year. Um, the other piece to keep in mind is we also have a fairly significant white fleet. Um, the White Fleet has a value of about um, $10 million across all, that's all of our maintenance trucks, our delivery trucks, food service trucks, the sedans, the, the whole shooting match. If you figure a 10 year lifespan for, you know, these are, they're, um, they're you know, regular commercial vehicles, so you figure 10 years, that means we need to be spending about a million dollars a year on White Fleet replacement just to maintain a 10 year lifespan. So. We should be spending about um, a minimum of five million dollars a year, on average, just to keep the to be hitting at those maximum um, uh, life expectancies. The you know the state mandates the 15 years. If you were to talk to fleet experts, what they would tell you is keeping vehicles 10 and 15 years is not a great plan. Um, they're inefficient. You can get much more efficient cars. You're doing a lot of maintenance. We should really be looking at replacement cycles that are significantly shorter than that, probably 10 or 11 years on the buses, um, and you kind of you're getting rid of them right as the extended warranties run out. On White Fleet, we should really be looking at probably something less than five years, um, especially with um, maintenance kind of vehicles. Um, you can turn them over relatively quickly and have a more efficient newer fleet that is cheaper to operate and maintain but it takes capital funding to do that. So you said it was over 15 years. On the school buses, 15 years. On the school years. buses. Yes, ma'am. So do we have any this year that we have to replace? Um, we've got enough um, space in our fleet that, w that we, can, we can extend them past the 50 year 15 years. We have to pay extra from that. We've been working very hard over the last couple of years to downsize our, um, to downsize our fleet, so I think we're okay at the top end, but we're just we're going to have to make it up at some point at some point we it, the bills all come due and there will be a year where we're going to need to do an 80 or a um or a 100 bus purchase and that's you know again multiply them all times 100,000 it's an 8 or a 10 million dollar thing if you if you push it all until when you try to make it up okay, clarifying question so the 5 million 
um, ideal, the ideal number, is that for the buses and the white fleet or just white fleet? Um, that's the that's kind of the ideal if we're on a consistent cycle just for the vehicle replacements. That doesn't cover some of the other capital things that we need, but but that is buses and white fleet together. Right? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Shepard, just to address your age question on this building, the oldest section was 1942. Um, which is this wing right outside of us, uh, to 1974, which is the piece that c connects the oldest, older building out front with the columns on it, which was 1953. And then the rest of it was done in the 60s, 65 and 66. The room we're in was 1966. <laughs> Anything else I can ask? We'll be back again on the 28th. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the district-wide projects are paid out of capital funds. Um, and maybe this is more for Chris than you. But yeah. um, for the ideal projects that we have, that's paid out of the bonds from the capital improvement compared to the 4%. General obligations bonds. General obligations bonds. And you use the district ones out of the general obligation bonds, too. It's all funded out of the same pot. Well, and, and all of the financing is handled downtown by Metro Finance. We're not involved in any determination of how that's funded. I know they do have commercial paper that they use on a short-term basis before they turn them into general obligation bonds. Uh, so they handle all of that downtown. We don't handle any of the debt um, associated with the capital. Um, and then back to Dr. Gentry's question, I, I got an answer. Um, from uh, from Sean, the 4% fund, uh, apparently that's uh, in the Metro Charter, and it's 4% of the General Services District funding uh, that's held uh, aside during the, uh, I guess, during the budget process. And so that's for basically all of Metro General Government, not for us since we are in a separate fund. But that 4% is laid out in the Metro Charter. And, and the Metro Departments use that for uh, roof repair, deferred maintenance, technology, and, and that kind of vehicles, I believe, and that kind of thing, whereas we fund all, have to fund all of ours through our capital budget request. And we do not break out our budget compared to the metro budget from the USD and the GSD. Like, we keep it all one unified. Okay. Any other questions? Going once. All right, thank you all so much. Right. the 28th. Sure.